Hi, and welcome back to the I Love Me Lab podcast. So today we're going to mix it up a little bit different. We've created this master class where we're going to have, where we have three top industry coaches um, talk to you about different aspects of your mind power. Because as you know, your mind is really what is what's controlling everything in your life. It's not about what happened. It's about how you decide to process it, right? And so much of that is unconscious. So how do we untangle the unconscious learning that we have so we make some conscious decisions and choices moving forward? So sit back and relax. I hope you enjoy our conversation with Simon Glendill. Glendhill. Oh, he's going to kill me for the mispronunciation of his name. He is a master, amazing master coach and trainer of NLP, timeline therapy, and hypnotherapy, followed by Dr. Mill Allen, also a master practitioner of NLP and master hypnotherapist. I mean, uh, Dr. Emil teaches doctors all over the world how to help their patients become pain-free without medication, all in the power of the mind. And then we're going to top it off with Kate Curran, also a master coach in many modalities. And she's created her own company uh, titled Reality by Design, where rather than a coach, she calls herself an artist because she believes that you can actually design your own life. And guess what? Once again, it's all about your mind and understanding that and how you learn to change things so that you don't, you're not faking it. You're actually believing it. And when you really believe it and you feel it, well, then you get to live it. So sit back and enjoy. And I'll see you on the other side. Hello and welcome to the I Love Me Lab show. My name is Gail Buck and I'm an NLP master life coach, meditation instructor, and a seeker of happiness. And each week, we're going to bring you an inspiring person or message to help you discover additional ways of self-care, self-love, and becoming a healthier, happier you. So thanks for spending time with us today, and let's let the show begin. Yeah, so we had talked earlier, something that I think is super fascinating um, in NLP is the communication model. And you are such an expert okay. in that space. And would you mind spending okay. some time just talking about how it's, you know, how it's it's good and important for us and valuable for us to understand that? Uh-huh. Okay. So it's, I think, for, first of all, the, the communication model in NLP, when I, when I first got into my studies of NLP about 15 years ago, they teach you that on day one, and it's it's basically how how does the mind work? Well, people think that many people just think if they haven't done any studies of the mind, whatever neuro based disciplines they may have studied, and so on. In NLP, we work very much with the concept that we have a conscious mind that processes everything rationally, and we have this thing that we refer to just terminology as an unconscious mind. So, what is the unconscious mind? It's I look at it this way, and when I'm, I was actually working with a group of students last night, I, I ran a seminar you know, yesterday evening here in Cape Town, and I was talking about this. I'm saying, look, how do you, as a, are there, any, there are close on 8 billion people on the planet right now. If, if I look at um, the latest mm -hmm. statistics, I think we're going to go over 8 billion in November this year. And here's the thing. There aren't two people on this planet who are the same. I mean, some people may disagree with me on that, saying somebody's been cloned, whatever, but really there aren't <laughs> two people who are the same. And then I ask people, I said, how do you know everything that you know? How did that, all that information, all that knowledge get into your mind? Everything that you believe, everything that is important to you, all your memory, how did everything get into your mind, everything that you know? And you play around with it a little while, and because it, it wasn't that you were born and there's a little nice USB port in the back of your neck, which you can go, okay, I'm just going to plug this in and download everything I need to know about right. life. Otherwise, we'd pass the math test the, you know, the first time every time. <laughs> but um, the, the reality is it, it comes into our mind. Everything that we know comes in through what we refer to as the five senses. It's what we see. It's what we hear. It's what we feel. And it's what we taste and, what's, and what we smell. Now, it's there are various estimations on it, though, the, and I don't know how they measure this, but when I first started studying NLP 15 years ago, it was said that there are 4 million bits of information coming into our mind every second. 
Now, mm -hmm. I never thought as a human being I'd be capable of that. I thought it was, you know, how the heck do I deal with that? The latest research from um, Cambridge University in the UK and the Department of Neuroscience is that there are actually 15 million bits of information coming in per second. So I don't know how that works, and I don't know how they measure it, but whichever which way. Here's the thing. We, we cannot consciously process that. And then it's... Okay, different people seeing the same event will have a different version of the of the same event. I hope that makes sense to everybody. So and if I think back to when I was a kid and I'd go to a family event with my sisters, my sisters would each have a different recollection of how everything went down to the one that I had, even though we'd all been at the same thing. So, so how does that happen? Well, if, there's a great book called Flow. Forgive me, right now I can't remember the author of it, but there's a book called Flow. If you have a look for it, you'll find a lot of what I'm talking about in there. And in the book Flow, it says out of those number of bits of information per second that are coming at us, we can actually only extract between 126 and 134. So the question that I have for everybody is how do you determine which of the 124, 136 bits you're going to pull out of the potentially 15 million per second? Yeah, so that's where it becomes interesting in the model of communication. Because what happens in life, we, we go out there, we, something happens, we see something or somebody says something to us. And it's just what we refer to as an external event. It then somehow comes through our mind and we feel a certain way. In NLP, we refer to it as a state, but we have a certain feeling. We could think we could feel angry. We could see maybe, for example, uh, just, just pull something easier. We see a mother smack her child in the supermarket. We see it. It runs through our filters. We decide we maybe feel angry because we think that's wrong. Or we maybe, maybe feel glad because our thinking is that that's a good thing. The mother should have done it. But the thing here is that it comes in from the outside. The external event is happening, 15 million bits per second. We select 124, 136 that runs through our filters that are unique to every single person on the planet. And then we create what we call an internal representation, which is the picture that we see. It's the reality that we believe we have seen. From that, we then feel a certain way. It will reflect in our physiology and it will determine what we do or what we don't do, what we say or what we don't say. Which so then, I believe go on. So yeah. I believe we're gonna get into the filters with you. We are, but, yeah. but I'm just I'm just it's so interesting because I studied with you um, uh -huh. and others. And it wasn't until this very moment that it it became more than just information that was coming into my head about the 15 million bits of information that we only, because you and I, even in this conversation, mm -hmm. we are probably selecting 126 yeah. different bits of information from each other. Anybody listening, right. Is, is yep. selecting out of those 15 million. We're all selecting different pieces and different combinations of pieces. Exactly. Starting exactly. there. That's so interesting. It's like yeah, right, exactly. th right off the yeah, right off the batter's box. I mean, you're you're grabbing different information from whatever it was that happened, right? Yeah. So so the way it is, any everybody and anybody who's watching this recording, they will all have a different version and a different takeaway to each other. Mm -hmm. Nobody will have exactly the same experience of it. That's the way it goes. Yeah, interesting. That's yes. the way it goes. Yes. So, if we, so if we just, if I just retract, we have the external event happening, which is usually in the five senses: the visual, the auditory, the kinesthetic, olfactory, or gustatory. It comes in, goes through our filters. We then feel a certain way based on how we feel. We will then, you, you'd see certain things in a person's physiology, basically body language and stuff like that. But what it would go through to is the behavior, behavior being what do we do or what do we not do, what do we say or what don't we say. And I think important to keep in mind that even if we don't say something or we don't do anything, it is still a behavior. So a non-behavior is still a behavior. And whatever our behavior is, whether we go up and tackle the lady in the supermarket or we snatch the child away or we just choose to turn a blind eye because in our thinking we think it's not the right thing to interfere, then that will determine what the result is. 
Right. No, it, it's important to get this because I work with many people that come along, whether it's for coaching or they're looking to be coaches. And what are people looking for? They're, look, they're ultimately looking for life to be different or to achieve results. And that can be mm-hmm. anything. It could be a result that's health-based. It could be a result in relationship with family. It could be a result that they want to increase their business or increase their salary, whatever it might be. And what many training courses do is they just go, well, you just have to change your behavior. In NLP, we go, well, if you just tell somebody to change their behavior, you're really just telling them to do something consciously. So what we look to do in NLP, we look to make change and hypnosis. We look to make change at the unconscious level. I'm sure, girl, many of your listeners have gone through similar things. So forgive me, everybody, if I'm repeating something, you think, okay, move on, Simon. I know all this already. But in NLP, what we look at doing is, is interrupting that loop. So when the information comes in, we acknowledge it goes through the filters of the unconscious mind. And if we change the filters, how the person feels is going to change Hmm. without even thinking about it. Yeah. And as a result, the behavior will be different and the result will be different. So really it makes the change easier. Okay. And so I am positive that there are many people thinking about, okay, wait a minute, what are you talking about Uh filters? Okay. So in talking about filters, this is where, you know, when we teach, we put all the filters up and we teach you how to work with each of these filters. But giving you an overview of what the typical filters would be, we'd be looking at the unconscious mind. I look at it this way. It's like I can be running about my daily life and I know I've got to go to the stores. I've got to do this. I've got to check what time something's going on. I've got to check what time a meeting is. But really, I'm, I'm doing that. I've got my calendar. I follow through it. But then there's Simon. So who is Simon? How does Simon think? What makes me who I am? What makes you who you are, girl? And everybody listening, you know, who are you and how did you come to be who you are and think the way you are? Well, the reality is if we, if we look at something like um, I'm, I'm just sidetracking away from the question, I'm going to come back right back to it. If we look, for example, at Morris Massey's work on the stages of of development, so between the ages of zero and seven, we have the imprint period, during which we'll supposedly take on pretty much everything that we are told as being the truth. So we'll just accept it. If our parents tell us that winter is summer, we'll believe it. If our parents tell us that the only religion that is anything is whatever religion it is, we'll take it on as being the truth. Right. Following that, we have the modeling period, which typically kicks in between the ages of 7 and 13, where as, as little as, as kids or as wannabe adults, we start looking outside the family. And we'll meet the parents of our best friends, or we'll find a teacher at school that we really like, or maybe a character on TV who we kind of think, okay, I'd rather be like this person than or think the way that this person thinks than the way my parents think. So that's when we look outside, typically the the, the parental area, and we start questioning. That's why teenagers can become a little bit troublesome. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the reasons. Um, So that's that's the age, sorry, that's the age is about 8 to 13. 8 to 13, we do the modeling. I maybe said that wrong earlier, but it's 8 to 13, we do the modeling. And then after the age of 13, we go into socialization. But back to, the, back to the filters, I like to imagine it this way, and, and I know there's a whole lot of stuff about past lives and handed down knowledge, and that's a different subject. It is connected, but it's different. But if I imagine that when we or if you imagine that when you're born, you don't really have that much in your mind. You don't know the periodic table. You don't know the alphabet. Um, you, you don't know these things. Consciously, at least, you don't know them. So all this information comes in and it stores in your mind. So the filters that we would have, we would have, for example, all our memories of stuff. You know, we'd hold all our memories in there. We'd have our beliefs would be another filter, what we believe is right, what we believe is wrong, what we believe is good, what we believe is bad. We'd have our values stored in there. So that with values being that which is important to us probably in the context of different areas of life or overall in life, what is important to us. We'd remember all the decisions that we'd made. And there's another thing in that language is in there and also meta programs, which is possibly a different subject for a different day. 
But essentially, the external event happens and it runs through all our filters. So if, if I go back to the example of maybe the lady in the supermarket who happens to you know, give, a, give, a, give a child a quick smack, if we have a belief that parents should never smack their child, it's likely that, that, act, that we see that happen on the visual or maybe we hear the smack as well. It goes through our filters and we know it's wrong and therefore we get angry. Somebody else could see it and could think, I'm glad that parent did that because their filters are such that they have a belief that there comes a point when you should smack a child. Now, if anybody's mm -hmm. making a judgment whether Simon thinks you should smack a child or Simon thinks you shouldn't, it's none of my business. People will think what they I, think. Yeah, and I just wanted to interject <laughs> something as well. Even the word, as anybody who is listening, the word smack, right, can have a okay. different feeling and a different meaning for different people rather than a little spank or something like that, right? Okay. Or discipline so, yeah. your child. Yeah, yeah. so even, even filtering it down to a word. Where smack uh -huh. for others might not mean anything at all. Yes. No, exactly. So it, a main thing about this is there's, there's two, there's two, so there are two things that are going on here. One, you've got 15 million bits coming at you per second. How do you know which of the 126 to 134 that you choose? Well, I'm going to go, that will go down to, it's a result of your filters. And it's also a result of what you're focusing on. It's also a result of what's in your mind, what you're focusing on. So an example I like to use, we have a, a street here in Cape Town called Long Street. And it's like the party street. It's uh, for anybody who's been to South Africa, you'll know about the Dutch coming in and the English coming in. So it's a beautiful looking street, probably a cross between New Orleans and an English street. And then it's got the occasional modern building in there. And it's become a bit of a party street. So people go out there, they'll hang around at coffee bars, at art galleries, at down and out dives. It's a, how do I say it? I guess cosmopolitan would be a little bit of a high end word for it, but it's very, <laughs> it's very mixed and it's, to me, it's a great fun place to go. But South Africa has its history. So there are many people here, typically from the older generation who go, you know, it's, it should not have changed. It shouldn't have changed. We shouldn't have had the ANC coming in with Nelson Mandela heading the whole thing up. And everybody should have been kept apart. So if I take somebody like that and I say, hey, why don't you just take a walk down Long Street and tell me how you experience it? So if I take somebody who's, let me say, negative about the future of South Africa, they'll probably come back to me. Well, and I've done this experiment a few times. So typically what I get back is they'll say to me, well, I see people drinking too much. I smell marijuana. Um, I see mess on the streets and it's very noisy. And that shows me that this country is going down. Mm. Yeah. And that is their wow. reality. But if you think about what they see is based on what they actually think, because their belief is already that South Africa is going down. So mm -hmm. they will then choose those 126 to 134 bits that match with their thinking. On the other side of it, yeah. Yeah. And that's their reality. That becomes their reality and it reinforces their belief that what they think is true. Um, and then if I take somebody who's positive about South Africa and who's optimistic about the future of the country, they go down and they say, wow, it's amazing. There's people of different races hanging out together. They're having fun. Yeah, I can hear laughter. I see people deep in conversation. I see people who I wouldn't have expected standing by an art gallery and going in. And they'll go, this shows me that we have hope, that we have a future, that we can integrate all the crap that happened in the past. Is that beautiful, the contrast? I mean, it's like, it's, wow. It's really, really beautiful, but who's right and who's wrong? Right. And, and whose who's reality is real? So what I'm saying here is really dependent on what your filters are through your experience of life will determine the world that you see. So in 1998, when I was at the peak of my career, I was about 38 years old and, as a, and I was uh, <clears throat> the chief of urology and vice chairman of surgery. Uh, and I was performing an operation on a patient removing their kidney for renal cell carcinoma, cancer of the kidney. 
And during the operation, a piece of medical equipment malfunctioned and it couldn't find ground. And it happened to use me as the ground. It, the electricity went through my hand, up my arm, through my heart, through my brain, and out my left ankle. And I ended up dying in the operating room. And my OR team, you know, that I was running, uh, they saved my life and they got me back. And, you know, to this day, you know, eternally grateful to them. But it wasn't without some consequences. I had a traumatic brain injury, which back then, nobody knew what traumatic brain injuries were, and it was very hard to diagnose. Uh, and I ended up in the ICU for about a week, and then uh, eventually I was having difficulties counting change or reading a book or maintaining my concentration. I had to close down my practice and move in with my, my parents who were alive at the time. And also I injured my left hand, and it was having a lot of pain with that. So I went through everything. I was going through hyperbaric oxygen treatments and nerve injections into my the brachial plexus to control the pain in my arm and my in my hand. I was going through uh, uh, occupational therapy and cognitive therapy and a lot of different things. And so during this process, it took about three years for the uh, brain injury to get to its baseline. And it took longer for the hand injury. I still suffer from the hand injury. And I have learned, I had to learn how to manage my pain drug-free because I was not going to go down that route. That I'd seen so many patients go down where they become addicted to opioids mm -hmm. or non-opioid medications. And I just wasn't going to do that. So I did my best to learn everything I could about a variety of different therapies that are out there, alternative type of therapies, which none of them seem to work specifically for any very long period of time until I learned about hypnosis. And uh, I kind of fell into that. I had been doing hypnosis. i got a mosquito running here from my around here. I had fallen into hypnosis because when I was in private practice, I would use hypnosis quite a bit for my patients who would come into my office and I would have to do, let's say a little minor procedure in the office. And we use some local medication, local anesthesia for the, for controlling the acute pain. And then also use some hypnosis to keep them calm and decrease their anxiety. And I was really amazed by how efficiently and how effectively it worked. But it wasn't until I had my accident and I went through the pain that I was going through on a daily basis that I did not realize how how much suffering people can go through. I mean, because I was really suffering and I realized how much other people were suffering. And that's the key point that I would like to get to the audience, whoever is listening to the podcast, is that you cannot lump all types of chronic pain into one silo like medicine has done. Uh, you know, you have chronic pain, you go see the, you know, the pain specialist. You have chronic pain, you got to take narcotics or non-narcotic medications to try to control it. You can't lump them in because everyone's chronic pain is as individual as their fingerprint. Your pain would be different than my pain or different from the person down the street. It's because pain is the chronic pain is the result of a lot of biological impacts. When I say biological impacts, I'm talking about psychological, physiological, and social stressors or impacts that happen to a person throughout their life that cause different behavioral responses or emotional responses that trigger the pain. So it's, it's not, it's not like if I went and s smacked your hand with something and I smack my hand with something, we're going to feel the same thing. It's going to be tied into a lot of other things that are going in our head and our background and things like that. Is that what you're saying? It's how we, we define what just happened or is about to happen? Yes. And it's not in your head. It's in your subconscious. Mm. And so I was actually just speaking to a uh, uh, integrative pain specialist about a week ago. And he was saying how he would have patients that would come in to his office and they would do different nerve blocks and things like that to these patients. And, you know, someone would do really fine. And then you have some other people that would come in and they really um, were having extreme emotional reactions to having 
a nerve block and the needle hadn't even been put into the patient yet. And the patient was already screaming, thinking that the needle had been put into the person, but the doctor hadn't even touched the patient. So again, there's stories that the person was creating within their, you know, from previous emotional trauma or emotional experiences that they had. And they were already running the story in their mind before the, the doctor had even touched the patient and that the pain level was going up. So <clears throat> based upon this, uh, going back to my accident, I was going through a lot of physical and emotional pain. And right around the time that I was finally getting better, it's probably about six, eight years later, and I was starting to get, you know, feel better and uh, was working again and consulting and doing things. My father got diagnosed with metastatic lung cancer. And it took him about three years to pass away. But during that time when he was getting sicker and sicker, and we knew the time was coming, all of a sudden, I started getting this pain in my, sh my right shoulder, the totally different opposite side of my body where I had my accident. I started getting pain in my right shoulder, and I got to the point where I couldn't get my arm above my head. I could get it to about right here, and I have this hard stabbing, you know, acute pain right here in my shoulder. And I went to see an orthopedic surgeon. He evaluated me and he thought I had a rupture of the cuff bone. And he wanted to get, you know, some MRIs and some other things. And, you know, I'm thinking, oh, gosh, I know where this is going to go. You know, we're going to end up having an arthroscopy and have to look inside and see what's going on. I'm like, you know, look, I, I'm getting ready to go to a, a retreat, a seminar, and I won't be back for a few weeks, but we'll do all this stuff when I get back. So... I went to the retreat. My father had passed by this time, and I was really grieving over my father. And when I went to the retreat, it wasn't a retreat specifically for grieving. It was just an overall personal development uh, a course that was being put on uh, by Tony Robbins. And I uh, and during this process, we went through this closed eye process where the lights were down, and he's taking, he's walking you through, regressing the person into a, your, your your past life to let go of a lot of this, the emotional stuff that you've been holding on for, for years that was keeping you from moving forward in your life now and in the future. And during this process, it's extremely intense and the lights are down and everyone, you know, it's 5,000, 10,000 people in the room and they're all yelling and screaming and crying and they're rolling on the floor. It's kind of, you know, if your first time you've ever been to one of those things, you'd freak out hearing all this stuff. But then after that, and all of a sudden the music changes and then, they make it more dramatic and it's exciting. And they're giving you all the possibilities. He's, you know, Tony's talking about all the possibilities that could possibly have in your life if you let go of all this BS you've been holding on to. BS meaning belief systems, right? And you're holding on to these BS and you let it go and you see where your life could be. And then he had the lights came on and everyone's celebrating and you're screaming and yelling and jumping around. And I'm screaming and yelling. I'm jumping around. I'm like, hey, wait a minute. Uh, my pain is gone, you know, because during that process, I'd seen my father at the weakest, uh, the lowest point of my life, right? Things couldn't get any worse. And I saw my father in heaven and his hand came out of heaven and said, Emil, it's going to be okay. And his hand went right into my heart. My pain went away. And it never came back to this day. And that was in 2007. So somehow the pain of your father, you converted that into, or your unconscious converted that into a physical pain. Absolutely. So that right there was, it got me starting to think that my pain was attached to an emotion. And I started looking back at another uh, episode that happened in my life. That was a, a, a groundbreaking episode that I didn't understand back in like 1989, but I certainly understand it, you know, when this happened to me uh, at, the, at the Tony Robbins event and then also how I progressed. So in 1989, when I was a surgical resident, uh, I was specialized in, in urology, and my chairman and I, we went down on a medical mission to Haiti. And we were in Haiti for about a month, and we were the only surgeons that were in this geographical location up in the mountains of Haiti, about four hours out of Port-au-Prince. And, you know, this is way back in 1989. And, you know, we're driving through the jungles and stuff. And, and all of a sudden we get to uh, near the hospital, we're seeing like 
this line of people and they were all waiting for us. And, you know, we were supposed to be going there to do urological procedures, but we were doing everything from A to Z. I mean, appendectomies, removing tonsils, taking out gallbladders, whatever the people needed, they, we did it, you know? Um, and so I'll, the thing about it was at this hospital, they were so short on supplies, they did not have any medications to give general anesthesia. So we were having to do a lot of these procedures with local anesthesia or with sp spinal anesthesia if it was a major abdominal operation, like if we were having to take out someone's, you know, part of it, one colon cancer, or, you know, or work on the prostate or take out a kidney or something. And the thing that was amazing that these patients, post-operatively, all they were given was two to three tablets of Tylenol, and that was it, because that's all they had. And... I remember I was making rounds that night after we'd operated on a bunch of people and none of the patients were complaining. Matter of fact, they were up walking around or having dinner and uh, with their family members and we'd ask them, I'd ask them how they're doing and they're like, oh, I'm fine. I was like, aren't you having any pain? No, I don't have any pain at all, doc. I feel, I feel just fine. And I'm thinking, wow, in the United States, you know, people will be crying and yeah. screaming and trying to sue you and everything else. And you know, for, and our yeah, oxy and my brain, yeah, and I need my sleeping pill. But none of these people were complaining. And I asked the nurse, I said, I said, her name was Antoinette, I'll never forget her. I said, Antoinette, why aren't these patients complaining about pain? And she said, Oh, Dr. Allen, it's because they knew that they had to have these operations, so they prepared their mind. Wow. And it's like they prepared their mind. And so that always stuck with me way back in 1989, even though I didn't know what that really meant. They prepared their mind. But I knew that when I used to play sports, and I, you know, I played football and soccer, and I get hit and banged up and knocked down, and, or you twist the ankle or something like that. And you just kind of shake it off, just like most kids do. You shake it off and you go back and play the game, you know, and it's the same thing. You, you, you distracted, I distracted myself or a person distracts himself away from the injury and then you're able to play the game. And then you, when you start thinking about the injury after the game, then it starts hurting again. Right. So that I, I felt, well, that's what they were doing. And it was at that fast forward back to the Tony Robbins event. It was at that event when my pain went away and I realized this emotional connection with chronic pain, I realized that um, what the mind expects, the mind accepts. So let's, I'll say that again. What the mind expects, the mind accepts. Because we have two minds. We have the conscious mind, which is the brain that's between our ears. Okay, And that conscious mind is very logical. It's very analytical. It has to rationalize everything. And if it doesn't make sense, well, you'll make up a bunch of lies and whatever you got to do in order to make sense. We see it all the time in politics, right? And a lot of yeah. other aspects of our lives. However, it's a very weak mind because it uses willpower. And just think about all the New Year's resolutions you've ever made or so, you know, anyone on this podcast has ever made. And yeah, it lasts a couple of days, a couple of weeks, and then you're right back to the same stuff that you were doing before. And but then we also have our subconscious mind. And the subconscious mind is everything else within our body and around our body. It's how we have 300,000 or 300, I'm sorry, 300 trillion plus cells that have over 6,000 receptors on them. And they're all, on each cell, there's over 6,000 receptors on each individual cell. And all these 300 trillion plus cells are communicating with each other, you know, and, the, and they're talking. And the way we know this is because there's been a lot of research. So, uh, there's one lady named Candace, Candace Perth, who's a biochemical engineer out of uh, Washington, D.C. area. And... <clears throat> And we know that they're communicating because if you, let's say, are in a coma and you're in the ICU, well, the brain is not functioning. The person is unconscious. They're in a coma and they're not able to communicate. They may be hearing what you're saying. They may not. We don't know. However, subconsciously, 
the physiology of the body is still running. All those 300 trillion plus cells are still working. And the lungs are still, ox- you know, exchanging oxygen and with carbon dioxide. The kidneys are still making working urine. You're still got your GI tract is still functioning. The muscles can still move around and twitch and do whatever it's doing. Liver still functioning. So even though the brain is not working, the subconscious mind is still running the physiology of the body. So that's another point that's so important to understand is that the physiology of the body is run by the subconscious mind, not by the brain. Okay. So, um, so that was just another concept or understanding that was very well, clear to me. Yeah. In your book, which we haven't mentioned yet, your new book, which is the pharmacy within you talk about mental expectancy, which is what you just referred to right now. Right? Yeah. Which so the mental, yeah. So the mental expectancy is what the mind expects, the mind accepts. And I, I learned this mental expectancy, expectancy when I was in doing my travels through Haiti. And it was a lesson that I learned after reflecting back on what I had seen there. And then also what I had experienced throughout my life. So unfortunately, pain, is, there's this general belief. Uh, that has persisted throughout society that pain is a, is directly proportional to the severity of an injury or a disease. And also there's this other thought that pain, it won't go away unless the injury or the disease resolves. And then also pain can only be effectively treated by a physician or through medications or medical interventions. And this is all wrong. It's all BS. Okay. And it's because it's the training that physicians have been taught throughout medical school of what chronic pain is, meaning chronic pain is a disease that is uh, of unknown etiology. Well, chronic pain is usually caused by a uh, chronic illness, which most chronic illnesses, illnesses are, it's a disease of unknown etiology. We don't know what's causing a chronic illness, like autoimmune diseases, things like that. And it's when the disease or the injury occurs and there's pain that lasts greater than three months. It's kind of like the general definition. There's other definitions out there, but that's general. And it, it's la- it's pain that lasts more than three months and it doesn't go away with the normal feeling of the disease or the injury. <clears throat> Whereas acute pain is pain that usually lasts less than six weeks and it goes away with the healing of the disease or the injury. Okay. Now, what so many people do not understand is that chronic pain can layer or develop or overlap acute pain. So it's ex- an example would be like someone with inflammatory bowel disease. They could have recurrent bouts of their inflammatory bowel disease, like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. And they're having inflammation and cellular damage, and that's causing their acute pain. Mm -hmm. But if that acute pain becomes associated with or linked to a eventual a uh, emotional event or some type of emotion within the body, then all of a sudden that acute pain can become chronic pain. Now. Here's my you can point. go crazy with that particular topic, by the way. In in people, you're unconsciously creating this pain in your body, right? I mean, I I, I, I well, I, I like it is, instead of saying unconsciously, it's subconsciously because to me, unconscious, you're you you're just out of it. You're you're like you're in that coma. You're unconscious. Okay. But your subconscious, it can be working all, it is working all the time while we are awake, driving a car, driving a race car, skiing down a mountain. Your subconscious mind is always working. We get this muscle memory and all these different things. Um, let me let me go a little bit step further so you can understand how this happens. So first of all, I've, we've been talking about chronic pain. I'm using the terminology chronic pain because of our audience is need to understand the difference between acute pain and chronic pain. However, I do not like using the word chronic pain. And I don't use the word chronic pain when I'm working with my clients who work with me over Zoom to relieve their 
chronic pain. I use the terminology, terminology conditioned pain. And here's the reason why. Chronic pain is not chronic pain. It's conditioned pain because you cannot just treat the pain in chronic pain. You have to treat all these biological impacts, the psychological, the physiological, the socials. And so <clears throat> if I had, if I, if, let me use this example of a puppy. If I had a puppy and brand a little puppy, just got the puppy home, he's cute, he's running around chewing on my shoe and pooping on the floor. And you're trying to get this puppy to be, become more behaved, right? You're going to teach the puppy how to sit. So the first thing you're going to do is teach the puppy how to sit. And you'll say, and you'll have a treat. Well, first of all, if you, if you just said sit, puppy, sit, 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 sit. Puppy has no association. They have no idea what this word sit means. They're still running around chewing everything up. But if you pick up a tree and you say, sit, and then you move the, your hand with the tree above the puppy's head, the puppy will move its head up in the air and to see the tree, their butt is automatically going to go on the floor so they can get a better uh. angle at seeing it. And as soon as they sit, you give them the tree. And you do it again. Sit, give them the tree. Sit, give them the tree every time they, every time they sit. So the tree is the stimulus or a conditioned stimulus, and the sitting is a physiological response or a conditioned physiological response. So when they link up the tree with the word sitting, then it all of a sudden it becomes conditioned. When doing it over and over with repetition and intensity, then it becomes conditioned. So let's think about that. I was doing sit, sit. So what did the puppy learn? The puppy learned that, number one, if they see me move my hand up, they're gonna, there's a treat in there. They're going to they're gonna want that treat. That's a, that's a condition of stimulus. Moving my hand without the treat, they're going to automatically sit because they're going to think they're going to get a treat. So that's a condition right. of stimulus. Me being in the room and saying the word sit becomes a condition of stimulus and they'll sit. Me just seeing me and the puppy thinking, hey, I like to get a, get a treat. I'm going to go over in front of Emil and sit, and I'm going to get a treat. So even though I was trying to teach the puppy how to sit with the word sit, they linked up four other things, maybe five or six other things that were totally unrelated to what I was doing. It just happened to happen. So that's positive reinforcement. Now let's look at negative reinforcement. Some, back in the day, some people would do negative reinforcement to train puppies. And they would say, puppy, sit. And the puppy's looking at it. Puppy doesn't know what it means, sit, sit means. So instead of them giving him a treat, they would hit the dog, maybe slap him on his butt and say, sit. Uh-huh. Or grab him by the neck and push, pull him up and push their butt down and say, sit. And they kept doing that. And if they beat the puppy or they're aggressive with the puppy, well, then the puppy's going to to be, develop all kinds of behavioral problems, such as they might, you know, start to coward. They might hear every time they hear the word "sit" instead of "sitting," they're running over to, you know, hide, or they roll over onto their back, or they start peeing on themselves, or they start chewing their paws with anxiety, or chasing their tail. Okay, but of course, that only happens with puppies, right? <laughs> okay. So we see this in humans all the time, you know, with abused kids, okay? And they develop behavioral problems or abuse adults who have gone through some types of trauma and they develop behavioral problems, okay? And again, just like with the puppy in the first example of me trying to just use the word sit to teach them how to sit, they linked up on their own, lifting the hand, me being in the room, them thinking about it. So if you think about it, it's the same thing for humans. Humans are no different than any other animal. Okay. Humans will link up and overlap other types of stimuli that they're exposed to and become and can be associated with as a conditioned stimulus causing the conditioned response or physiological response of pain. So that's why I don't believe we should even be calling it chronic pain. I think there should be acute pain, 
and there should be condition pain and get rid of the world. So why do you think that we as humans are so afraid to do what we really want to do? What, what, what drives that fear really? Some of it, some of it, I think, you know, my husband and I were just having a great conversation about like, how, how do we get, how do we get conditioned into doing other people's will? I'm doing what other people want us to do. Um, doing what others think we should do. Like how does Others expectations, right? Yeah, those ex- expectations. Oh, well, part of it starts at home. You know, as you're a child, you want, you're, you know, you're told what to do by your parents. You know, you're, you, you basically need to do that, right? You want to be sure. a good kid. I have two kids. I understand how it goes. So you have that at home, right? And then you get conditioned through school to obey authority can I go to the bathroom? Um, you know, I bombed a test. Am I good enough in your eyes? Are you validating me? Uh, do I have permission to do anything? And so it, that conditioning yeah. continues and continues and continues. And like some people break out of it and some don't. And you need to bring that to your awareness. We were talking uh, earlier. My husband was in the military. Now, my husband was the type of person that would well, he would do what he's told, do what he's told. You know, you're conditioned sure. to obey authority, mm-hmm. obey authority. And that is massive conditioning that he had to break out of to think, be, and do for himself. So a lot of it starts at home. No, that's huge. I mean, when you're, it's, Yeah. I mean, when you're in an environment where like, especially like when you're in the military or something, but not even like that, even when you're in a, you know, in a family kind of an environment or yes. your community and society and you are, a, you know, you're, you're conditioned to be the way it's supposed to be the way you should yeah. behave or what you should do. I hate that word should. It's like, I what know. is that? Should? I should. Cause you're either doing it or you're not. And if you're not, why not? And if you are, exactly. why, you know? Because I'm supposed to. Who says you're supposed to? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's just bringing awareness to that conditioning. A lot of times, just bringing awareness to something will allow you to let it go and set it free. You don't need a lot of hefty, crazy techniques to change your life. And for those who are ready to work in that way, you know, um, those thoughts and those beliefs are there for people, but you've got to give yourself permission to do it. I mean, anything that we haven't experienced in our life, it really comes down to the fact that we haven't given ourselves permission to do it. Is that crazy? It is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So in reality by design, so you're, you're coach, or what, what is that? Cause we were talking earlier, you know, coaching is like, cause there's so many different kinds of coaching out there. Right. So, mm-hmm. so, whoa, you're an artist, reality by design artist. So how do you work with people and help people to kind of get past their stuff, you know, or to be able to give themselves permission or to even before giving themselves permission, really digging in so that they really understand what they want. Because I find that a lot of people don't really even know what they want. They don't even give themselves permission to the possibilities of exploring whatever that may be. When it comes down to figuring out what people really want, I like to do, um, have them do a little bit of a thought exercise, which is if you already had millions of dollars and you already bought all the toys that you wanted to buy, you, I don't know, to, uh, rented your private jets, hung out in your Rolls Royces, did whatever it is that you wanted to do. After you've already had that experience, what would you do that brings you to life when you were bored after having all that? Because, and I want to bring this to Hmm. people's awareness, a lot of people find their purpose from a state of lack. Yeah, they do. Not from a state of abundance. 
So dig into the difference of that. So what happens when you operate from lack versus operating from abundance? Operating from a state of lack and trying to find your purpose, energetically, you wind up doing things that are not your purpose because it's motivated from fear and lack. Though if in your mind, you've already had the experience and you're giving your imagination that experience over and over again, right? Because the unconscious mind does not know the difference between Mm -hmm. an experience that you have in your mind and something outside. It does not know the difference. So you want to train your subconscious mind to already be looking for your purpose from a state of abundance. And then you attract and align with what it is you're really supposed to be doing. So there is some variances and distinctions between finding my purpose from a state of lack and thinking that I'm starting this business from a state of lack and I'm doing this and I think this is my purpose. However, but I got to make some money fast. So it's really all about getting money, money so I can oh. pay for this bill or whatever exactly. the thing might be. Exactly. Yes. Though when people come from that place, they usually wind up doing things or uh, entertaining businesses or doing a lot of stuff that their soul really isn't aligned with. And if a person's soul is not fully aligned, which is like your head, your heart and your guts aren't fully into it, you'll subconsciously sabotage it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Sounds well, familiar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, when, so if you're meditating and you're immersing and fully becoming immersed in the feelings of having already had all that, I've already done that. I've already had it. I'm free. Then what would I do if I was bored? What would I, what would I really do? Because without all of the lack, you know, on your shoulders and all that pressure and all those expectations and all that conditioning that people, you know, put on you. So, you know, you you had to develop some personalities to fit in. Who yeah. would you really be and what would you really want to do? And I'll tell you what, when you go down that journey, you find out that your purpose is a little bit different than what you thought it was. How interesting. So even like when you were describing that just now, it's almost like I was able to imagine the lack and the fears and all that stuff, like in a, like in a sack, you know, in a sack that you could carry. So what if you put all that stuff, if you imagine putting all that stuff and then setting it down for a second, it's like, I give yeah. myself permission to set this down. Woo. You know, what is now what? Right. Now what, what? Do I really want? Because I don't now have all what? that stuff. Yes, right. exactly. Now what? I mean, just you saying that. Get look, look at me light up because yeah. I've, I've experienced it, right? And yeah, and just just like you said, um, you know, uh, uh, it depends on who I'm working with. Uh, some people they have a belief system to where they need to go into the past. They need to deal with the past stuff. They need to be, deal with the past traumas, the past dramas, all of it. And of course, you and I know uh, timeline therapy techniques, and we can always provide that service. Though there are people who are ready to work in a different way. Okay? Mm-hmm. Instead of me having to go back through the past, some people are showing up and they want the change so fast that all I need to say to them is, you know what? Imagine your entire past and all of your problems as if you are holding grocery bags Mm. and hanging on to those grocery bags. They're so heavy. And some of that stuff is getting old. It's starting to stink. It's starting (laughs) to stink. I can barely walk. I can't do much. And it's so heavy. Now, go ahead. You can go ahead and set those grocery bags of your past down. Go ahead and leave them here with me. I'll take care of them for you. And it's okay. No need to worry. They'll be there for you if you ever feel like you want to pick them up again. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, I don't have to do a lot of timeline work on the past. Yeah. And some people, and this isn't for everyone, Gail. Like it depends on where the person is at in their journey, where they're at in their consciousness, though some people are ready and willing to work in that way. 
Yeah. And, and just, just for clarification, it's absolutely with total respect and love. If somebody sure. has some work to do in the past and they're, oh, yeah. you know, and it's, and it's serving them to work through that. Um, yeah. and having said that, um, sometimes you can, you can just leave that past back there because we remember, I come from a big family and it's always interesting to me also how some of us remember something, uh, maybe it's a parallel universe things. Some of us remember some things and some of it's like, I have no recollection of that. And they go, how could you not remember this? And I, and I'll be thinking, there's no way. I don't even think that anymore because I know that we all process differently. And I would say, well, it, may have happened like that. I don't know. I don't remember it at all, or I remember it different. But sometimes when we're stuck on that past story, understanding that sometimes there's some pretty big, ugly, you know, traumas that happen. But when we're stuck on those past stories, how much of that story did we massage and change and nurture the really nasty parts and give those nasty parts love to make them even bigger so that they're able to grab onto us, right? Do we really want them to keep clutching us at this juncture? Yeah, I have found that a lot of people need to give themselves permission to change the story, number one. Yeah. Um, and what you did say a moment ago about the love and respect, and some people do need to mm-hmm. go into the past, that is correct. Yeah. Yeah, sure. You know, some people do. And then that's on our job as a coach to intuitively, you know, calibrate if that person needs that, of course, I'm going to provide that. Right. Right. Though, like where I'm at, I seem to be attracting people that don't need to do that anymore. Because that's your pendulum. That's, that's where you're, you're, this is, this is like, it sounds to me like you've got this Let's yes. fast track, fast track yes. pendulum to let's, let's build, I'm going to build my own world. I'm yes. going to build it exactly like I want it, you know? Yes. Well, it yeah. makes sense. You know, as we look outside of ourselves, uh, technology is evol- evolving, you know, faster than the speed of light. So if technology is evolving so fast, guess what? Our consciousness has to too. Yes. And some of us yeah. it is. And like for, for some people, you know, they're in a different space where they would need to go into the past. For the most part, I attract people that are like the, the fast track. Like they, they're just ready to go, okay, like g- give me an easy way to just let go of this and I'll give it to them. Right. And, and they're, they're ready and they're willing to take that on. And that's for those who are ready to work in that way. And that does not mean that everyone needs to be ready to work in that way. You know, right. I get it. How boring would the world be if we were all, if everybody was the same, right? No. Yes. Exactly. Like uh, to give you an example, and I would do this in trainings too with students. I had a lot to do. And sometimes I would think to myself, wow, you know, I could do uh, a belief change with some modalities. And quite frankly, and quite honestly, I think that the belief change in NLP using that some modalities where you're doing that, it's like calculus. Mm-hmm. And guess what? I didn't want to deal with it anymore. And I thought to myself, okay, <laughs> consciousness. Yeah, yeah, I'm being real. I could, I could write a book, uh, Confessions of a Master Trainer. <laughs> <laughs> and I just kept thinking to myself, and I've said this to myself over and over and over again, like their consciousness is continuing to rise. Consciousness is evolving. Consciousness is evolving at the speed of light. There's got to be a faster way to do this. And you know what? One day I walked up to the student. And I said, do you want to change that belief? And they said, yes. And I held out my hand and I said, I want you to project that belief right in my hand. And they did. They projected yeah, the, the, old, the old one that they didn't want, the one that they didn't want, the one that they wanted to get rid of. And I said, I want you to project that energy, that uh, visualization, everything that goes with that belief in my hand. And they did. And I said, good. And I went like this. And I walked over and I threw it in the trash. <laughs> and I went like this. And, and I said, okay, now, what do you want to believe instead? Okay. And I said, now you put the belief that you want in your hand, project that image, project the energy, project what it would be like to have that belief, and then just merge it inside yourself. And the change worked. And so that's where I started just playing around, you know, like how how fast can I help people change? How fast can I help someone evolve? 
Because outside of me, everything is evolving so fast. So there's got to be ways in which I can work that are um, faster. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. It's like because I I think it's another conditioning, right? From sure. from all the well, a lot of people still go through therapy, and again, some people want that. And yeah, I don't even want to use the word need. Some people that it benefits them, and that's what they want, and that's sure, their choosing. Sure. That's her choosing, and that's a beautiful thing. But it yeah. used to be that that's all there was, right? And so right. it was like this long process to change. And then it's been getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. And right. really, like some all people, you have to uh, do is change your focus. At the end of the day, you just shift your focus. So how do you help somebody get that. tools to shift their focus, right? Right. Like um, we'll just uh, talk about like um, – switching identity behavior in the context of alcoholism. Like my mm -hmm. mother was a alcoholic and she did the AA program for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And for some people, they need that process. Right. They really do. Depending right. upon where they're at, they need to walk that process. That's mm -hmm. not everyone. There are alcoholics that have showed up on the screen and I would have said, uh, do you, uh, do you want to identify as being an alcoholic? And they would say, no, no. And I would say, okay, <laughs> then drop the identity, avoid people who want to reinforce that old you. And then I would, of course, would do some hypnotic inductions on, you know, immersing themselves in the energy of the person who has already been living alcohol free. Yes. Already. And here's another thing that I do, Gal, that you, you were not taught in your training. <laughs> what I do, um, because whatever it is that we want, we need to be a correspondence match to it, right? Uh, I, if you've ever heard the saying, um, the poor get poor, the richer get rich, mm -hmm. right? Poor, yes. poor people, they correspond with lack. Rich people correspond with wealth, so in order to switch the energy of that so that you can correspond with wealth, correspond with success, whatever it is, I did a little bit something different in our master trainer program, and I didn't ask permission to do it. I just started doing <laughs> it, and everyone uh, got great results. I put the memory of it already have happened in the past, in the past past. Wow. So you're going back from now. Yeah. And you put that memory of that experience, you plug that in there. Wow. In the past. So that energy is creating a ripple effect towards the future. So wow. Now, did you put it in the past during an induction with hypnosis or with just... Both, both and and however... Uh, way Whoever I saw works. fit. Def definitely uh, timeline, definitely hypnosis, definitely Im emerging, immersion into the event itself, uh, the thoughts, the feelings, the beliefs, everything. And then I put it in the past as wow. if it had already happened. It's already a done deal. It's already happened. And quite frankly, Gail, it has because in a parallel universe, it already did. It did. It did. <laughs> You're darn right. Wow. Did. I'm going to you know try what? that. I love that. Yes. 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 And try that, Gail. Try it and notice how you feel in your body when you do it. Because yeah. if you're, I found, and th this isn't for everyone, like mm -hmm. I found for me, if I'm putting a goal in the future, it's like I'm, I'm wanting, I'm reaching, I'm, uh, uh, it is, it's like this energy of need and want and chase. Right. Yes. So when I, put it in the past and you can see where my timeline is. Can't you like, yeah, it's, it's always yeah. been the same too. Uh, <laughs> when I put Mine's it like the, that too, <laughs> right. When I put it in yeah. the past as if it had already happened, my nervous system is completely calm. It's completely relaxed. It's already in knowing that it's already happened. And Isn't that interesting? So yeah. you're not trying to consciously not have that angst or that, Knowing back here that you're, it's it's a goal and you're hoping, right? You're actually coming from a place of you're. It already happened. You're already living this line, right? Yeah, yeah. Huh. Mm-hmm. 
And wow. I, as I've been talking about this, uh, there are some students who, you know, they, they're they really ingrained and entrained in the NLPs, things that we do. And I understand mm-hmm. that and I get that. And mm-hmm. there's a time where we need to evolve beyond that and right. try different things. Now, they would, um, you know, show up and say, well, uh, you know, we were trained not to do that. We were trained to put it in the uh, future and the unconscious mind needs motivation to go towards it. And I'm like, well, why don't you just try it and see what happens? Right. You know, see what results right. you get. And, and don't be so the- much in a, in a, in a tight little box when you're learning about not being in the tight little box. Now don't right. put yourself in this tight little box, right? Outside of this one. Right. Loosen right. up a little bit and, and see what works for you and what works for your clients. Exactly. Too, if you're right. Because a lot of students get stuck on, well, my trainer said, my trainer, you know, my trainer, whatever. Well, your trainer is not the authority in this universe. And quite frankly, neither am I. You are. You are the meaning maker and measure of all things in your universe. How about you uh, try something new? Right. <laughs> you know? right. Right. I think, and I think really being conscious of the fact that whatever that process was, that was developed, or even timeline, the way it was developed was developed by an individual who found yeah. that work. That doesn't mean that you can't take it and and tweak things to see what's right for that client or what's right for you, right? Because right. We're, not, we're not all exactly the same. We're not all going to respond the same to a particular process. Yeah, I have found, you know, when I was working with clients and putting a, a timeline, you know, future in their goal that it wouldn't happen. And I really had to dig under the hood to figure out what was going on. Yeah. You know, is there a secret subconscious payoff that they have for not having it happen? Uh, Do they not Mm -hmm. have the energy to follow through on the intentions? And a lot of times that happens. And sometimes people have an addiction to fear. Thanks so much for listening to this conversation. If you enjoyed it and want more information on our guests and resources, please visit ilovemelab.com. And please, if you enjoyed this episode, remember to subscribe and share with a friend. Hey, there's more great episodes to come. So until next time.